Hey guys, thanks for coming back and watching another video. I really appreciate it. Today we're in the greenhouse and we're talking about this plant and this plant, which are the brown turkey figs. It's a fig that's specifically really nice to grow in my area, zone 7A, and it will survive each year with no problem. Turkey figs, there's a lot of different varieties. I've heard someone say there are hundreds of varieties of, of figs. So this particular fig is probably the most common that I've seen in my area is the brown turkey fig. This was a small cutting taking a cup, taken a couple of years ago, and it's doing quite well. And there's actually, I can show you later, there's a small fig growing even on this relatively new cutting. But today we're going to talk about propagating figs and everything in every way to propagate from a plant, and especially this plant, which is a brown turkey fig fig if I can get if I can get that out right so yeah this is the brown turkey fig and we're going to be taking cuttings today so taking cuttings and this is gardening 101 I'm sure almost everyone watching knows when you take a cutting from the mother plant you're basically just creating a clone an exact replica of the plant now it may not look the same but genetically DNA wise it is exactly the same plant just cloned so that's basically what we're going to do is we're going to clone this plant and as this is a clone of this plant, we're just going to do it once again. So the optimal time to take a cutting from most plants is, especially the turkey fig or the fig in general, is late winter or early spring. Now, obviously, this is not late winter or early, early spring. This current, the current time is we're in going into the second week of September. So we're in early fall. So it's, a, it's okay to take it in the fall as well, and it will probably be no problem. But you're going to need to take a little bit of extra care when you take cuttings from the fig tree in the fall as opposed to when the tree is completely dormant in late late winter early spring it's going to be less uh, upkeep or just having to keep a closer eye on it but we're going to do this in september and it's no problem because i believe we did this same one a couple years ago in september so it will work and this is a living proof that it will work now fall is a period for most plants they're going into a transitional state it's going to start taking this energy from the the, uh, the top part of the plant, the leaves everywhere, and it's going to start transitioning that energy back into the roots in preparation for winter. So that's why this is still a fine time to take it because as that transition happens, we can take the cuttings and we can be pretty sure that it's going to be a, a, a successful propagation. Obviously, if you do this in the late winter, early spring, your rate of propag propagation success is going to be much higher. But it's still okay to do it in September, and I'm sure these will turn out just fine. Now, if you're taking a cutting from an in-ground tree, you want a, a tree that's been producing well and that doesn't have any apparent signs of disease. And that is something you need to look for when you're prepared to take your cutting. If it's a diseased tree or if it's just not producing fruit, the genetic makeup of that tree may not be suitable for your area or your zone. So that's one thing you need to remember is you want a tree that is healthy, produces fruit, and that you would want to duplicate or want to clone. So that's a, an important fact to remember is you want to make sure you have the, the tree that you're taking the cutting from is the tree you're going to end up with. So if it's a tree that doesn't produce fruit or it seems to be diseased, you're just transferring that problem to your cutting. And so ultimately you won't be happy or you'll have failure in that cutting, even if it survives. So the cutting you're going to take from your mother plant you want to make sure that that branch is disease free that there's no damage to the branch or any other visible signs of disease because that is so important so like i said earlier i'm just repeating that to make sure the branch you choose if the rest of the tree is got something wrong but if you see a good branch maybe you can make it work but you just want to make sure that the branch you're taking the cutting from looks good but if overall the tree looks diseased Try to avoid it. Maybe this, there's something wrong. Maybe the tree is in a state of decline, disease, could be heavily infested with pests. So just make sure you're just going to do a kind of an overall inspection of the plant before you take the cutting because you don't want to waste your time and energy several years down the road and just end up with another tree that's not viable or that's not suited well for your area. Now the branch we're wanting to take a cutting from, we want it to be semi-hardwood. We don't want it to be um, too young like these right here they're very green and soft I don't know if that's showing up on the camera very well but we want one that's kind of a greenish brown and this branch right here is perfect it's this year's growth but it's not extremely young like this one so you don't want one that's too young or too old too old would be down in this area down here I think it's better to take this semi uh, hardwood probably I'm saying there's a 99% chance that's this year's growth I haven't paid much attention to this fig lately but this is the branch we're going to take for our first cutting and we're going to avoid any older wood or at the top any really young new uh, 
branches that have came out. So that's what we want, semi-hardwood. So we wanna make sure the branch we're gonna take has several healthy nodes. Now this one in itself, I'm not gonna go all the way down. I might cut it here, but, but make sure it has several healthy nodes along the branch. This one has, I believe, seven, maybe eight. And there's a bud about to burst on top and it looks like a couple of other areas where buds may form so this is a good cutting and i see some other areas on the other side these branches are starting to cross so i'm going to probably take that one uh, one thing to remember about figs is that the sap that runs through them can kind of be caustic to human skin so you want to wear gloves you don't want that on your hands if it stays on your hands for a long period of time you may have some irritation or you may have an allergic reaction so make sure you wear your gloves when you're doing the cutting because that sap can irritate you a little bit. So at the risk of repeating myself too many times, we just wanna make sure that we have a certain length. We want between six and 10 inches of branch, of branch. not more than that, because too much is gonna put a little bit too much stress on it. So we wanna make sure we count off three or four healthy nodes before we take the cutting and then take the cutting at a 45 degree angle. So that is what we're looking for is a good branch, three to four, <clears throat> excuse me, three to four healthy nodes and that will ensure more success, not too, not too short, not too long, six to 10 inches. Okay guys, so I'm looking for my cutters here. I've set them over here real quick. I'm gonna spray them with, I always forget the name of it, Listerine, or it's a, a generic equivalent just to make sure there's no diseases on the cutters. I do this every time I start doing any type of cutting or pruning, just to make sure I'm not transferring diseases from one tree, one plant to the other. And then, then I'm gonna wipe them down and make sure I remove that. So our pruners, cutters are now disinfected and I'm gonna take about, um, I'm gonna do about 10 inches on this one. So we wanna cut it at a 45 degree angle to make sure we get more surface area for water absorption. And we'll just cut it right there. And so these are brand, almost brand new cutters and it cuts really well. Now you can see there is a, I'll try to come in closer, but there is a, sap starting to form instantly and that's what you don't want to get on your skin because it can irritate you it's not highly toxic or anything like that but it can irritate the skin and i'll give you a close-up there in just a second okay guys after some difficulty getting it to focus closely there is a sap instantly coming out of the newly cut branch so that's one thing to realize even though i'm not wearing gloves i am completely aware of the caustic nature of the sap so just going to let you know Make sure you're wearing your gloves and try not to get it on your hands because you may forget it's there and then some irritation might show up later. So these do run sap very quickly. And so just make sure you keep that in mind when you're taking your cuttings. One final word about taking your cutting is you want your cutters to be as sharp as possible, whether or not you resharpen themselves or you're using a separate pair of cutters for your propagation and another pair for just general pruning in the garden because the sharper you're cutting, the less damage you're going to do to the plant cells and the bigger chance you're going to have of the success of that cutting. So that seems like a minor detail, but that can be very important having two sets of cutters and you just remember which one you're using for propagation cutting and which one you're using for just general pruning throughout the garden. It's important to sterilize both in between plants and that's a good thing to remember. But just want to say that one more time is make sure that your cutters are clean and very sharp to do propagation. So right after you take the cutting, it's a good idea if you're going to take multiple cuttings and you're not going directly into the uh, soil or the soil mixture, you want to make sure you keep this moist. So what you can do is take a paper towel and hit it with your great solo spray. I've had this for years. I actually have three of them and it's really been a great tool in the garden. It lasts forever and you can angle your spray when you're doing homemade pesticides or whatever you're using, but I keep them separate just in case. I don't want to put uh, some weed killer in one and then have it end up in the other. So natural weed killer. If you look at my videos, you'll find where I made that actually before, and I've actually posted a video about it. So we're going to wrap this in a paper towel, a wet paper towel, just H2O in there, just water. And I'm going to set that aside until I get everything else ready. So that way it's really critical. You don't allow that to dry out. If you're doing this and it's kind of warm outside, this can dry out really quickly. So just make sure you keep it moist until you uh, are ready to put it in its um, potting soil. I'm trying to get that out there. Your potting soil. So we're going to go next to that in our potting soil mix. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the two components I use for fig cutting. Now, before I go on to our potting medium, I want to say one thing about transporting it. Let's say you went to a friend's house or relative's house and you took the cutting. It's always important first to wrap it in the paper towel and then put it in a Ziploc bag or a plastic bag, zip it up so it 
maintains its moisture if you're a distance from your home or whatever, or if you're transporting it from one location to the other, it's a great idea to do that so you can keep the humidity on the cutting as high as possible and ensure that the success of this cutting will work. So that's one thing to remember, paper towel first, then in the plastic bag, and then you can transport it. This is not an all day thing, but if you're just, you know, an hour or two away, I don't know the exact time it would last in a Ziploc bag. It might last overnight, but you just want to try to get this process started as quickly as possible. So as soon as you get home, start working on the propagation of your cutting. So guys, I want to talk about the potting mix that I'm using for these cuttings, for the fig cuttings. Um, I'm using 50% perlite and 50% sphagnum moss. Now, what I want to say about perlite, because I want to demonstrate the difference in cost here, this tiny little bag here only had a small amount in there. It was $10 or more. I'm going from memory, so don't quote me on that, but I believe it was $10 or more. Then I went up to a two cubic foot bag from my local big box store, and it was actually delivered free of charge. They have a delivery. I don't know how they make any money off that, but it was actually delivered for United Parcel Service, our served our internet or national uh, shipping company. I guess that's an international company, but it was like less than $20 delivered. So that's an amazing thing that they can deliver that and not lose money. Then I went to my local um, privately owned nursery where they do a lot of potting themselves. This is also perlite, but this is four cubic feet and it was $30. So you can see the bigger you go, the more money you save. So I would say, remember, if you can get it at a local nursery, a privately owned nursery, you're going to get a much better deal. The peat moss, I just buy it in the big cubic block. Anything bigger than that particular one right there, it's extremely heavy, and even that one is difficult for me to pick up. So I'd say these are the two ingredients, and if you can get the perlite cheaper by getting it in volume, a larger bag, you're going to be a lot happier with your savings there. Okay, I'm, okay guys, I'm going to put my gloves on for the next step, which is wounding the base of the cutting, and this is what I do on a lot of different cuttings. It's very common in the propagation world. And so I'm going to try to open this where you can see it. And so it's nice and moist. It's been sitting here for a while. But what we're going to do is we're going to squ scrape off an outer layer of the cutting down to the cadmium layer, maybe an inch to half an inch. And I'm using my gloves because I don't want the sap on my bare skin. I'm just going to take maybe half leave the other side on. This is going to promote root development and activate those hormones so it can start producing roots. So I'm going to cover this back up just for a minute because I'm going to get the container ready and I want to talk about a little bit about this container and how it's going to work and help us get this pruning, <laughs> this cutting, I almost said pruning, this cutting off to a great start. Now I've showed these in other videos before. It's just a used uh, water container. I believe it's got alkaline water, something my wife drinks. And so what we're going to do is, this is going to be our mini greenhouse right here, but I'm going to cut it close to the top so we can have plenty of soil and we're going to be able to keep that humidity, humidity inside the container. So sorry, I know that's extremely loud. I'll probably edit that out. Okay, I know that's going to be too loud. Let me cut this and we'll come back and I'll show you the after so I won't damage your hearing there. Okay, so I've cut our gallon size water container, the top out of it, and we've left a good bit of area here to put in our potting medium. And so that way we can put this back on. I can tape it with some of this electrical tape. It's very good. It's waterproof. It's even better than the painter's tape I often talk about. So I think that's the best thing to use. It's made by 3M and it will take quite a bit of water and it will not come off. So anyways, we put our cap on and we glue, tape everything back together. We're going to put a small drainage hole about an inch up so it can maintain just a little bit of moisture at the bottom. And that way the cutting will be in a high humidity environment and have its maximum chance of rooting and success. Now there's a couple of things I want to say about the potting mix. One is going to be that 50% uh, um, peat moss and it's going to be very dusty. It's okay. It, it might irritate your sinuses a little bit so you may want to wear a mask or be very careful. Don't do that on a, don't mix it on a windy day. But what I do want to say about perlite, it's more toxic to you. Not that it's dangerous, it's basically just a stone but it's extremely dusty unless you wash it yourself or buy it pre-washed. So you don't want this getting into your sinuses. Basically, perlite is just volcanic glass that's been heated to about 1,000 degrees, and it kind of acts as popcorn. It kind of looks a little bit like popcorn in, in a strange way. But just make sure you don't breathe any of this in. I've done that before, and it's not good for you. So I'm always extremely careful. I'll either wash it or just try not to stir up any dust, do it on a very calm day, which is like today. I have not washed this, so there is dust there. 
and I'm just being extra careful. I just wanted to say that about perlite. Please be careful. Now, one thing before we move on to the rooting hormone, I will say that figs can root very easily without rooting hormone. I just like doing this step just to increase the chance of its viability. You, when you use the rooting hormone, put it in a separate container and then dip your cutting into it. You don't want to contaminate your rooting hormone. Some people say they've never had an issue, but they never really know because some of their cuttings could fail because they've contaminated the rooting hormone. Some people say, some professional gr growers say they've never had that issue, but they may not truly know why some of their cuttings have failed. So that could be a reason. We never really know everything that's going on biologically unless we just get down to the scientific with a microscope. So I would say just make sure you take your rooting hormone and put it in a separate container, then rinse that like this little spoon I use. I rinse it and wipe it off just to make sure I don't contaminate. Now, if you don't have any rooting hormone, it's not absolutely necessary. Figs are known to be very good at self-rooting without the hormone. I just like added that. I like adding that extra chance so I can make sure that I'm not wasting my time. Okay, I've washed my perlite just a little bit to knock down the dust because I don't want to be breathing that. But we're only going to use a small amount of it. But I still want to make sure there's not a lot of dust floating around. Even after washing, I still see some dust. So we're going to do a 50-50 mix of perlite and peat moss. And I'm just kind of eyeballing this because we only have two cuttings today. And so I'm not going to mix a lot of it. I'm going to put my gloves back on and mix this by hand. And so this is a pretty much sterile mix here. And that's what we want to reduce our chances of disease in the cutting. And the perlite allows moisture to pass through. The peat, the peat moss is gonna hold in moisture, so they work in conjunction with each other. And so we know that our potting mix is the premium mix, not potting mix, I guess this is a cutting mix, you might call it. But anyways, our mix is at its premium mixture to do exactly what the cutting needs. Hold moisture, but not stand in water. We don't want the cutting standing in water. That's why I'm gonna put a small hole in the bottom of the container to make sure that if there's any excess moisture, if I put too mo much moisture in, that small amount might drain out and I'll leave a small space at the bottom just in case so it can wick back up to the cutting. So I think we have it properly mixed and I'm gonna move on to putting this in our just cut water bottle. Now this looks like just a standard potting mix, but it's actually just those two ingredients. Uh, some people say to use, ver some growers will tell you to use vermiculite as well, but I just don't think that's necessary because that peat moss is holding moisture. The perlite is allowing water to pass through and holding in oxygen. So these two I think are just fine. So you can add the vermiculite if you'd like, but it's just adding another level of cost and probably just not really necessary. I'm gonna move this out of the way and move on to our container. And I've talked about this many times, this uh, soldering pin, soldering pin, whatever you want to call it. I've used this so many times on plastics. It's so, so much easier than using a drill or trying to puncture your way through with a sharp instrument. So I just really like it. It'll melt right through. I've heated it up and it's, it's rechargeable. It's easy to use. I think it was less than 10 bucks. So if you want to get one there on Amazon, I'll try to remember to put the link in the description. But basically I'm going to leave about one inch of the base and put a draining hole on each side. And you can see it's just melting right through. And I'm going to put one on the other side, about one inch up. And so that way, if I accidentally add too much water to it, some of it will be able to drain out. But we're going to have the top on it. It's going to be taped, and that's going to maximize humidity. If you want to let fresh air in, you can remove the cap and let some fresh air in for a little while. But the main thing is to remember to keep the top on there while it's going through that state of adding roots. And the great thing about this clear container, unlike a milk jug, you can see if roots start forming in there. So that's one thing to remember is I would choose plastic, clear plastic over a milk jug so you can see what's happening to know if you've succeeded or possibly weeks or months later, you just don't see any roots. That's probably an indication you need to start over. Getting back to using milk jugs rather than a water jug, this, this particular container has never had anything in it other than water and it was alkaline water or something like that. But if you're using a milk jug, you need to clean it out and sterilize it with either a mild soapy solution or the uh, Listerine or Listerine mouthwash equivalent, whichever you can find. But that bacteria from the milk may cause an issue. So you have to remember that you want to clean it out. But like I said, I don't have to worry about that with this particular jug because it's been nothing but water in there. So I don't have to worry about anything 
being in there that shouldn't be in there. Okay, I'm going to fill our container with our peat and perlite mix. And as a general rule of thumb, you're going to want to put your cutting two nodes deep into the mix. So that's really important to remember because those nodes are where your roots are going to originate from also at the very bottom of your cutting. But that's three places you have a chance to see roots originate from. So I'm going to fill this close up to the cut and do a little bit of compression to make sure it's not too, too airy. But we definitely want it to be well enough for drainage. And so I think we're close to the top. I don't want to compress too hard, so I'm just going to kind of carefully work my way around and just add a little bit more peat and perlite there. And there you go. That's ready for the cutting and ready for, to have the top reassembled and put on top there. So this is my trusty chopstick that I use to create the hole so I can put the cutting in there with an, without knocking too much of the rooting hormone off. But something that a lot of people forget is this also especially being made out of wood, could contain a lot of bacteria and germs. So you want to sterilize this as well with the whatever medium you're using, whether it's rubbing alcohol or maybe a professional sterilization product. But I just like the Listerine. It's really cheap at the dollar store. And so I'm going to make our hole for our cutting. I'm just going to wiggle it around there so I don't have to worry about knocking any of the rooting hormone off. Like I said, these these a lot of people say these root even without rooting hormone, but I just like to give it that extra chance of just starting out on the right foot. Okay, the next step is to take our cutting out of its wet paper towel. You can see we've wounded it there. We've cut off at a 45 degree angle, all these things to hopefully maximize this chance. And I'm going to put this, the spoon right here, I'm going to rest the cut end and make sure the base of this cutting gets completely covered. It's just a good practice to do that. So we're there. We're going to put it back in the hole. We're going to go two nodes deep. So there's a node here, a node here. And so we're going to leave at least two thirds of the cutting sticking out of the soil. That's always another practice to do. We're going to press, compress the soil around the cutting. And so we still have rooting hormone on there. We have two thirds of the cutting sticking out. There's a leaf bud coming out. One thing I will say that I probably forgot to mention, I removed some of the leaves from this before I did the cutting. You want to do that, remove all your leaves. And if there's two leaves at the top, this one has a bud ready to open. So I went ahead and just left it as is. But if you have two leaves on the top, that's even better. You can cut the leaves by at least 50% and that will actually help the plant or help the cutting get a head start there. But you don't want to have a lot of leaves on here because it needs to focus its energy on creating that new root system and not maintaining those leaves. Okay, since we have a top, a hole at the top of our, our uh, container here, we can look at how far we need to go down further. It looks like we're up a little bit too high, so I'm going to have to push down just a little bit further. And that's kind of against the rule there, but I don't want it touching the cap. So there we are. We're a little bit lower in the soil than I want to go, but this container only has so much space. Sorry, I know this noise is probably going to drive you crazy. I'm going to tape this back on with this electrical tape. It's completely waterproof. And so this is going to seal it and I don't have to worry about water getting out other than out of the drainage holes. So that's something you need to take into account. If you don't put it into a container like this, you're going to have to water it and make sure that it's in this perfect environment. We're going to have to try to get this in there. But that's one thing to remember that if it's inside of a little miniature greenhouse like this, you don't have to worry so much about the perfect watering amount because it's just in this perfect environment it's in its own little ecosystem sorry i hope that's not drowning me out there but anyways we're going to tape all the way around to make sure we seal that gap the only place water can get out is the two small holes we made we've got a perfect little system here perfect little greenhouse whenever we're through watering we're going to put the cap back on and it's protected there i'm not going to ever put this in direct sunlight you will absolutely cook your cutting and it won't survive so you want it in bright light shade you know all shade you don't want direct sunlight hitting this at any time of the day because the temperature in this jug or any kind of glass container that's sealed is just going to go through the roof and your cutting will not have a chance of surviving so make sure it's in complete shade complete shade from sun up to sundown until it's ready to go to its next pot so if you're using if you're doing the cuttings in an open container and you're monitoring the soil you want the soil to be evenly moist and never waterlogged. This system right here just makes it so much easier so I don't have to worry about that. But evenly moist would mean you stick your 
finger in there and you feel, okay, it's still moist, but it doesn't feel soggy. Uh, you might compare it to something like a wrung out sponge. You're just going to feel moisture, but it's not going to be soggy. So that's the key is if it is soggy, you're, there's a much bigger chance of root rot. And even though it may form roots, you may see leaves coming out nothing will happen because it will die of root rot. So that's one thing to remember, don't waterlog the soil. Now there's one more thing to remember about watering. This watering can has been sitting out and it's probably lukewarm because it was in the potting shed all day. I felt of it, it wasn't hot, but it was just lukewarm. You don't really wanna put cold water directly out of the tap into your cutting because it can shock the cutting. Uh, lukewarm or room temperature is the key watering temperature when you're starting your cutting. It's, it's a remote chance, but it's still a possibility that could happen. So you want room temperature or lukewarm water. Now, if you do decide not to do it in a sealed container like this, and you're going to do it in a pot or just open ground, I don't recommend that. But if you do put it in a pot, put some type of clear plastic bag over it, and that will help build up the humidity and ensure the success of the cutting. Uh, you want that maximum humidity for the cutting for it to succeed. So if you don't have some type of system in place, uh, just a clear plastic bag will work great. So that's one thing to remember is you wanna maximize humidity. Might still work, but you're reducing your chances of success quite a bit. Now, a quick word about light and how much light it needs. It technically, does, te technically <laughs> if I can get that out, it technically doesn't need light initially. So I would put this in, if you're gonna take it inside your home, Put it in a north facing window. You definitely don't want it in a south facing window where it's going to get too much heat and sunlight. North facing window, if you have a greenhouse, a shaded area of the greenhouse in the yard in a completely shaded area, you just want to go back to that key of not allowing direct sunlight to hit this at any point during the day because this will turn into, instead of a mini greenhouse, it will turn into a mini oven. Another, the next thing I want to talk about is temperature of the cutting and where you're going to keep it. This one is actually going in my house. The optimum temperature for roots to form is between 70 and 80 degrees. My house is generally around 73 degrees. So that is the perfect temperature for the roots to start forming. You put it in the outside area. You want to try to avoid if you're going to have huge swings in temperature like extreme heat or extreme cold. Obviously, you don't want to do that. So put it into a garage and maybe monitor the temperature in there. But the best place to start it is going to be interior home where it's about 70, 72, 73 degrees, and that will give it a much needed head start. Now, one thing to remember, if you are gonna start this in an unheated greenhouse, potting shed, tool shed, whatever, inside your garage that's not heated, and you think the temperatures are gonna to get too cold in there, a heating mat is an essential thing. I'll put the link to this heating mat. It came as part of a kit, so this is a great thing to have if you wanna keep that temperature at just the right level if you're doing this later in the year. September here is still very warm, so I don't have to worry about a heating mat. But if you're doing it in November, December, January, February, the cooler months, and you're putting this in an unheated location, the potting, your thing here, you, I'm really tired today. You want to put the heating mat under it. So that's one thing to remember that if it doesn't, if it's not heated, if you're not taking it inside your house, make sure you use the heating mat. Now about root development, and you're going to have to be patient for that portion because that can take anywhere from three to six weeks, depending on the variety the growing conditions, how much uh, it, the plant is able, how much vigor it has. So you can, in the clear containers, that's why I prefer them because you can see if you've suddenly developed roots, you'll see them around the outer edges. You can also give it just a gentle, gentle tug, but I would just wait about that. Give it three to six weeks for those roots to form so you don't damage any of the tender roots. That's one thing to remember, three to six weeks, and I would lean towards the six week side so you can just give it plenty of time. Patience is key on taking these cuttings. Now, should you see loot, loots? Hey, what's loots? If you should see roots around the, the outside of the container or you see leaves forming, you know you're, you're on a good start to having a successful propagation of your fig cutting. But what you want to remember that it needs to be acclimated from inside this container. So you're going to remove your top, allow fresh air in there, maybe even just wave your hand. And then at some point, you're going to remove your top. You give it another few days once you see that happening and let it start to acclimate before you take it outside. Once you take it outside, keep it in the shade and you don't want extremes in temperature. You want it to be very nice temperatures outside, very comfortable temperatures. So that way it will have a chance. If you have it inside, you might take it from inside to the garage and then outside just to allow it to go through that acclimation period where it slowly starts to be able to tolerate the differences in temperature. But again, no direct sunlight at this stage. Now the next stage of 
your cutting here is going to be going to a slightly larger pot. You don't have to go crazy and put it in a giant pot, just a couple of inches larger than this. This is, I don't know, maybe six, eight inches. So I'm just going to go to probably to a 10 to 12 inch pot and not much deeper. So that's one thing to remember is once it's developing the roots and you see leaves coming up, you're going to gently take it out of this pot and put it into a slightly larger pot. At that stage, you're going to probably want to do a really good soil mix. I have a video that I made about creating your own potting soil. So I'll link that up at the top, but then you'll just carefully transport it so it will be able to get more nutrition from just the perlite and the peat moss. So that's one thing to remember. You're going to just slowly size it up as we did on this one. This one right here started out exactly as this one has in this size pot. So a few years later, it's a really nice tr tiny fig, but even though it's tiny, it's got a great little fig there that's already started. Okay, so let's suppose you've transplanted it to another pot and you feel like it's ready to go into the ground, which you're starting to see lots of flowers, lots of roots. It's very, very healthy and very happy. Once you plant it in the open ground, you're going to want it to be in a sunny location, six hours of daylight or more. They really are going to do best in a lot of sun. Um, you could put it in partial shade, but it's not going to produce as much. And I think you won't be as happy with the all overall result. So I would remember, remember to do that. You want to plant this in full sun. And that is very important because you want the whole purpose of this is to have figs. And that's what it needs. It needs sunlight. Once your fig is in the ground, you're going to want to make sure that you water, fertilize, and make sure you monitor for pest and disease. And I've got some videos about treating naturally organic homemade pesticide. I'll put that up at the top. But that's one thing to remember is just you're going to want to monitor it. Now, when you do plant it in the ground, you want the, your hole to be twice as wide as the root ball. Whatever size that it is, if it's this size or larger, you're going to double that in the same depth. You're not going to plant it deeper. You're just going to plant it the same depth as your current pot that you have it in. But that double width really allows the roots to expand out and you can put that rich soil all around that area and that'll give it a boost growing into its next stage. The first two years that your fig is in the ground are the most critical. Those are the years that it needs to establish its root system. So you'll want to make sure you water at least two times a week. Make sure it's heavily watered and allow it to drain off. You're going to want to fertilize at least with a slow release fertilizer or fertilizer fertilize weekly with a high phosphorus fertilizer. And I'll put the link to the fertilizer I often use. It's got a very high phos phosphorus amount, that NPK, the phosphorus in NPK is what really is going to help the root development. And it's got nitrogen and potassium as well, but the phosphorus is really for developing roots. So that is what you want to do. Once it's in the ground, you want to give it its best shot those first two years. About pruning your fig tree, you want to keep it open and airy to allow airflow and sunlight. Uh, you want to prune any dead branches or diseased branches off to keep it healthy. And you just want to make sure you keep that fertilization schedule up for those first couple of years. That is so critical so you can have success in growing lots of figs. So I tried to think about the most interesting thing about, I didn't want to bombard you with a bunch of facts about figs. So I wanted to tell you the most interesting thing I've ever learned about figs is a fig is not actually a fruit at all. It's actually, and here's one right here, it's actually an inside out flower bud and the seeds are inside there. So you're eating a flower when you eat a fig. So that's an interesting fact I knew about figs from many, many years ago. And it's just, uh, one of those weird facts of nature that you think you're eating something, but it's something totally different. So lastly, I want to talk about zones and where fig trees can live. Fig trees aren't normally known to survive extremely cold winters. And if you're in an area that does get extremely cold winters, it can survive if you give it proper protection or if it's in a large pot, you bring it inside to a greenhouse or a potting shed, it can survive a really cold winter. I know somebody that lives up in the Northeast and he had heavy frost damage on his fig tree. I'm lucky I never had that problem. They come back year after year and my mother has one that goes back 20 years and it has figs every year and my wife loves taking the figs and making a sugar-free jelly that you can spread on toast and it tastes like it's got pure sugar. It's a little known fact that figs are one of the sweetest, uh, I could say fruit, but it's not technically a fruit, it's a flower, but it's one of the sweetest fruits that you can eat and they're really good. So that's what I wanted to say about figs. You want to make sure that you give it protection in the winters. I will, at the description, I will put a list of zones four through 11, I think it is, and I've got a fig, four or five fig types that will survive in each zone. So I'll put that in the description and uh, that will give you an idea. These turkey figs are perfect for zone seven A where I live. 
So that's what you want to consider is just because someone has a fig and you want to take a cutting if you're visiting out of town, don't assume that fig will survive your area. You want to find one that is will survive in your minimum temperature in your wintertime area. So guys, I want to say thanks for watching. I really appreciate it. It's The channel has hit a couple of significant milestones to me lately, and it really just encourages me. It makes me feel good that someone out there is listening to me. So I want to say thank you very much. And um, I hope you guys have a great day, and I hope you learned something about figs, and I hope you'll consider growing them. It's really a great tasting uh, thing, and if there's anything I loved as a kid, it was fig newtons, which actually had figs in them. Hard to believe that. Maybe not today, but back then it did. So have a great day, guys, and I really appreciate you watching.